Soumya. At the cost of repeating, I hope that everybody is eaten well, but uh, please try and be awake. Uh, we have, let me start immediately, we have the first speaker is the uh, is Honorable Honda Taro, he is the Parliamentary Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs in Japan. Uh, we have a recorded message uh, speech from him, so can I ask for the recorded message to go on the screen please? His Excellency Gotabaya Rajapaksa, President of Sri Lanka and the Chair of Fifth Indian Ocean Conference, 2021st. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me congratulate the Indian Foundation on the opening of the Indian Ocean Conference in UAE. The COVID-19 pandemic has been driving the international community into a historic transformation. And the theme and timing of this conference is befitting. The vast Indian Ocean is an important region for realizing a free and open Indo-Pacific, HOIP, which Japan has been advocating. This region not only covers the strat strategically important sea lane, but is also crucial for economic activities for many stakeholders. As the international community faces immense changes and conundrums associated with COVID-19, it is a free and open order based on the rules of law that will bring peace and stability to the Indo-Pacific and beyond. A free and open Indo-Pacific is a vision based on such idea. To realize this vision, Japan has been advancing concrete cooperation in the Indian Ocean region, Japan has provided assistance to port development projects in East African countries and conducted counter piracy activities in the Gulf of Aden. Japan is also promoting cooperation with the countries of the Indian Ocean Rim including in the areas of ecology, economy, and epidemic, which are the main themes of this conference. Firstly, let me touch upon ecology. The importance of green economy is increasing as countermeasures against climate change have been advanced on a global scale. In October 2020, Japan declared to realize carbon neutrality by 2050 and in December 2020 adopted the green growth strategy. Japan also aims to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 46% from its fiscal year 2013 levels in the fiscal year 2030 and will continue strenuous effort in its challenge to meet the lofty goal of cutting its emission by 50%. In the COP26 World Leaders Summit last month, Prime Minister Kishida announced to provide up to 10 billion US dollars both in public and private finance. In the coming five years, which would include our contribution to the launch of innovative financial facility for climate, as we partner with the Asian Development Bank and others to support the decarbonization of Asia 
and beyond. Prime Minister Kishida also referred to double Japan's financial assistance to approximately 14.8 billion US dollars in the area of adaptation to climate change. Japan is providing support to the coastal countries in the Indian Ocean region, including island nations, to prepare for climate change and natural disasters. For example, we supported a project for improvement of the meteorological radar system in Mauritius, a project on strengthening religions in Cyclone Edai, affected areas in Mozambique, and a seawall project in Mare Island, Maldives. Secondly, on the economy, the world economy has been seriously devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The risk of depending on a limited supply chain has been widely acknowledged. Therefore, it is imperative to firmly uphold free trade and add layers to existing supply chains to avoid such risk. Toward this goal, Japan has actively participated in international discussions in platforms such as the WTO. Also, we have been leading the way to make high standard economic rules to realize a free, open, fair, inclusive, non-discriminatory, transparent, predictable, and stable trade and investment environment, and to ensure the free global movement of people, goods, and capital. Looking ahead to a bright and prosperous post-COVID-19 era, we are determined to continue to expand the cooperation in the field of economic security as well. In addition, in order to bolster economic activities in the developing countries, Japan is implementing the COVID-19 crisis response emergency support loan of up to 700 billion Japanese yen or 6.3 billion US dollars over the course of two years since the outbreak of the pandemic. Japan has provided related finan financial support to the countries in the Indian Ocean region, such as India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Kenya, Mauritius, and Maldives to contribute to their economic recovery. Lastly, I would like to briefly touch upon epidemic prevention. As people's lives, livelihoods, and dignity are threatened across the globe, it is important to strive towards achieving universal health coverage based on the principle of human security that leaves no one's health behind. Japan has taken multi-layered efforts on this front. First, to overcome the current crisis of the pandemic. Second, to strengthen health and medical systems. And third, to establish an environment resilient to infectious diseases. Japan has been providing COVID-19 vaccine-related support in cooperation with the COVAX facility and other international frameworks to ensure equitable access to safe, effective, and 
quality assured vaccines in all countries and regions. In addition to Japan's financial contribution of 1 billion US dollars to the COVAX facility, Japan has donated and delivered 30 million doses of vaccines and will provide up to around 60 million doses in total. Japan has also been supporting cold chain system development as last one mile support to ensure the delivery of vaccines to vaccination site. The Indian Ocean is vast and involves many stakeholders. After experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic, Japan believes that it is a common perception that multilateral cooperation is essential to overcome various challenges. Japan will continue to join hands with all the like-minded partners in the Indian Ocean region for the stability and the peace of the region. Thank you. Since it's a recorded message, we have no scope for any questions. Uh, that brings me to our uh, next speaker, uh, the Vice Foreign Minister of Vietnam, Mr. Nguyen Vok Zong. He will be talking to us virtually. Welcome, Honorable Minister. We can't hear you. Hello? Yeah, now, now you're audible. Thank you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the great honor to uh, address the fifth Indian Ocean Conference uh, 2021, organized in Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates today. Uh, I would like to uh, express my uh, sincere gratitude and appreciations to the government of uh, Sri Lanka and the Indian Foundations, the S. Rajaranam School of International Studies and the Institute of National Security Studies, Sri Lanka, for hosting this significant event. Five years since the first Indian Ocean Conference in 2016 in Singapore, this gathering continued to, Recording in progress. to be a valuable uh, uh, to be a valuable avenue which brings together key stakeholders to deliberate on uh, fostering a zone of peace prosperity and development in the Indian Ocean region. It has indeed evolved into a flagship consultative forum for regional countries to discuss Indian Ocean affairs. Vietnam had the great honor to host the third conference in 2018 in Vietnam to contribute to this common course. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, connecting Asia the Middle East and Africa with Europe and the Americas. The Indian Ocean's critical sea lanes serve as lifelines of international trade and the gateways linking world continents, states and peoples. The Indian Ocean abundant resources has been the source of uh, prosperity of the coastal communities since ancient time. Together with the Pacific Ocean and other oceans and seas, the Indian Oceans are essential to peace, prosperity, and the st stability of the rule-based order of the Indo-Pacific, a vast region which is home to billions of people and great civilizations. 
In the past two years, however, the COVID-19 pandemic has wrecked, wrecked uh, havoc to regional economies and societies, threatening the social economic achievements that regional countries and peoples had obtained through hardship during the past decades. Moreover, there have been deep concerns about the risks posed by climate change and sea level rise, which can seriously hinder efforts aimed at sustainable recovery. Also of equal concerns are the non-traditional threats to the marine environment, such as plastic debris and over-exploitation of marine resources. In this context, the theme of today's conference, Indian Ocean Ecologies, Economy and Epidemic, squarely addresses the severe challenges facing countries and peoples of the Indian Ocean region. These intertwined challenges are not unique to the Indian Ocean regions, but are also challenges facing many regions and countries. Dialogues such as these are, are very useful to share best practices within this region and across reasons on how to effectively tackle the, these multi-challenges. I concur with the view that given the rising importance of the oceans to national security and development of many nations in this region, there is an imperative and urgent need to develop extensive and profound awareness of the significance of oceans to sustainable development and economic recovery. Such common awareness should provide a strong social political platform to develop more cohesive and effective cooperation arrangements in order to preserve and utilize oceans and seas in a sustainable manner and safeguard a peaceful and stable maritime environment. Such much needed for broader regional peace and stability. As a coastal state, Vietnam profoundly understands the immense value of the oceans and seas to people's lives. We are implementing our strategy for sustainable development of Vietnam's marine economy towards 2030, which aims to utilize marine resources in a sustainable and responsible manner for our overall national development. The strategy also reaffirms protecting the ocean ecology as a key priority and include concrete targets for the reductions of ocean pollution and plastic waste and development of small uh, smart coastal cities that are environmentally sustainable. Vietnam's marine economy strategy also sees climate change and sea level rise as urgent global issues and sets specific goals and directions to take steps for proactive adaptation. Vietnam shares the difficulties of small island states, littoral countries, the most exposed and vulnerable countries, and low-lying coastal countries who are at risk of being negatively impacted by climate change and sea level rise. For that reason, we consider climate change, sea level rise, and its impact on global security and development as one of the high priorities during our non-permanent uh, <clears throat> membership of the United Nations Security Council in 2020 and 2021. Also, as recently emphasized at the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of the parties, COP26 in uh, Glasgow, Vietnam would make use of our own domestic resources in terms of finance and technologies, along with the support of the international community, including through mechanisms under the Paris Agreement in order to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. With regards to the fight against COVID-19 pandemic, Vietnam believes international cooperation is key because no countries would be safe unless all countries are safe. We should uh, step up cooperation to ensure broader access to vaccines, medicines, and medical equipment to combat COVID-19. 
Vietnam highly appreciates the precious assistance of many countries in its fight against the pandemic, especially the timely provisions of vaccines and commitment to co-production of vaccines. Vietnam also stands ready to contribute to the global fight against the pandemic by sharing its best practices and know-how, including its domestically developed vaccine when ready. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, ASEAN's vision for cooperation with the Indian Ocean region is captured in its outlook on the Indo-Pacific AOIP. The AOIP's objectives are to promote an Indo-Pacific region that embraces openness, transparency, connectivity, and inclusive inclusivity. ASEAN encourages external partners to work with ASEAN to undertake practical cooperation identified in the AOIP, including various areas of maritime cooperation. ASEAN countries are ready to work with Indian Ocean countries to share best practices and promote cooperation on issues of common interests. While jointly striving for peaceful and sustainable use of the oceans and seas, it is necessary to emphasize that all policies and conducts of states at seas should be consistent with the international law, especially the United Nations Charter and the 1982 United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. UNCLOS sets out the legal framework within which all activities in the oceans and seas must be carried out and is of strategic importance as the basis for national, regional, and global action and cooperation in the marine sector, and that its integrity needs to be maintained. All states should uphold their legal obligation under UNCLOS, ensure freedom, safety, and security of navigation and overflight, respect the sovereignty, sovereign rights, and jurisdiction of the coastal states over maritime zones established in accordance with UNCLOS, settle disputes through peaceful means in accordance with international law, including full respect for legal and diplomatic processes without resorting to the threat or use of force. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the Indian Ocean and South China Sea are deeply connected ecologically, economically, as well as politically. The fifth Indian Ocean Conference provides a valuable opportunity to share perspectives on emerging issues and explore ways and means to address these issues in an inclusive and constructive manner. We look forward to learning from these experiences and to adapt them where applicable to the South China Sea. Likewise, Vietnam and other Southeast Asian nations are always willing to share what we've learned from our experiences, promoting cooperation and tackling similar challenges in the South China Sea to our friends in the Indian Ocean region. Once again, I would like to thank our organizers for this unique opportunity to address the conference. I wish all our delegates good health, success, and happiness. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Excellency. I think you have uh, laid out uh, very well uh, as to what needs to be done, what laws are to be followed. Um, uh, we'll take one or two questions if it is okay with Excellency. Um, uh, me as a moderator, let me have the first question to you. Um, you know, you spoke about the connectivity between the South China Sea um, and Indian Ocean. And there have been issues on ecology, particularly in South China Sea, where the, the marine ecosystem has been destroyed by reclamation of islands. Um, and there is no way to, does not seem to be any way to reinforce uh, the laws. Uh, in your opinion, do you think there is a possibility of uh, Indian Ocean and South China Sea, particularly As ASEAN, uh, coming together and forming a uh, some kind of grouping to look after the, or emphasize on the protection of ecology uh, in these two areas, uh, so that it can be collectively taken up at various forums. 
since the India Foundation is hosting this uh, conference mainly on primarily ecology is one of the major factors, we would uh, request that if you have any suggestion to make. Uh, yes, I, I think that's a very good idea. Yeah, well, actually, uh, we, uh, we in ASEAN, we have, the, as I mentioned in my speech earlier, that we had already adopted the EOIP. And uh, we have been discussing, you know, how to uh, 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 get uh, closer to the Indians' uh, uh, ideas, India's ideas of the free and open uh, uh, Indo-Pacific. And actually, uh, um, during the summit uh, last month uh, between India and ASEAN, uh, the leaders have agreed on a statement uh, to make, you know, the, to, uh, to link the two uh, strategies uh, and uh, uh, views of ASEAN and India to make it closer. And by that, of course, uh, ASEAN have already got uh, numbers of mechanisms and we can uh, uh, make use of those mechanisms. And we hope that we also seek closer, get closer to uh, what have been uh, created uh, relating to the ocean, uh, to the Indian oceans. So the two, maybe the two uh, mechanisms, one of, by ASEAN and the other by ocean, uh, Indian Ocean can now uh, work together and of course, uh, also including the, the area, the fields of ecologies. Uh, so I think it's uh, very uh, feasible uh, if, uh, you know, the both sides have to work together uh, more on, to discuss more on these issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions from audience, please? Sonoji? Thank you, Excellency, for sharing the perspective of your government uh, with us here today. Uh, my question is particularly related to the India-Vietnam uh, relations, and particularly um, when we are celebrating five years of uh, the comprehensive strategic partnership between the two countries, and also uh, the fifth, uh, 50th uh, anniversary of the diplomatic relations between India and Vietnam, um, uh, do you think, uh, as we have been uh, also reading uh, um, 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 in newspapers and all, uh, regarding the possibility of um, uh, a trilateral partnership uh, that is JIV, Japan, India, Vietnam? So could you throw some light on this, if there is a possibility of something happening like that? Oh, I think uh, Vietnam is a test great importance uh, to uh, our relation with India, as you mentioned, we are going to separate the 50 years of strategic partnerships and, uh, and um, of course, the 50 years of our Republic relations. Uh, but I, I must say that uh, our relations uh, are excellent. Uh, but now, of course, I, I think that uh, a trilateral cooperation is another formula that we should pay attention to, to make use of, to make, uh, of course, the India have some strengths, Vietnam also has some strengths, but uh, combined those strengths sometimes are not enough. If we have another, combined with another country's strengths, and I, we have already bring up this, we brought up these uh, ideas to um, uh, our our colleagues in, in other countries like uh, Japan, like uh, South Korea, and uh, this idea is uh, most, mostly welcomed. So I think it's a very good direction and we work together uh, in the futures. Thank you very much. Excellency, we have just one more question, if you permit. Yes, please. Uh, uh, Apuru Mishraji. Thank you, sir. Uh, Your Excellency, my question is about the 13th Party Congress that happened earlier this year in Vietnam. Uh, one of the most important takeaways from that Congress was the importance of diplomacy in securing interests of Vietnam. And you saw that both in the texts of the resolutions that were passed and also the fact that several diplomats were promoted to higher echelons of the Communist Party. 
Um, one phrase that kept sort of uh, recurring in, in, in the text of the 13th party was the idea of proactive diplomacy to secure Vietnam's interests in the Indian Ocean region. Could you throw some light on what that phrase proactive diplomacy means to you and what are the means that you would be looking to uh, undertake in the next five-year cycle to secure your interests in the Indian Ocean region? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you have been uh, following the policies of uh, um, uh, diversity five and multilateralize our, our relations, external relations. And uh, so far, we've been uh, following the, uh, the policies of uh, deeply in integrating into the international communities. And so, so over the times, uh, we uh, understand that uh, diplomacy can uh, uh, make a very important contribution to the development of the countries to uh, mobilize uh, um, energies and also uh, forces uh, to help the, uh, the constructions, the building of the nations. Uh, that's why our Congress, uh, our party Congress, have decided that uh, diplomacies should take the proactive uh, position in leading other branches, other agencies of the countries in uh, widening. Uh, external relations and uh, integration, deepening uh, the integration uh, with the region and in the world. And by that, of course, uh, in the coming time, uh, we'll be more actively and more proactively uh, engaging in uh, international affairs, regional affairs. And uh, I think, uh, of course, in uh, within ASEAN, for example, Vietnam will play a more and more uh, active roles. Uh, we would uh, show the duties, uh, important uh, tasks that ASEAN is now taking on. And um, I, 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 I do hope that with that, uh, the role of Vietnam and the position, the posture of Vietnam will be heightened thanks to uh, proactive diplomacies in the coming years uh, by thus you know helping the the construction the building and uh, of the countries thank you very much thank you excellency for sparing your time and speaking to us and enlightening on how vietnam looks at these issues and also taking on the questions very well thank you very much sir yeah you are very welcome thank you Uh, may I now invite uh, our next speaker, Sri Bharat Raj Podialji, the Foreign Secretary of the, our neighboring country, Nepal. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor and privilege to address this fifth Indian Ocean Conference being held in the beautiful city of Abu Dhabi. Let me begin by extending our warm congratulations to the government and friendly people of UAE on the Golden Jubilee celebration of their independence and wish for continued peace, progress, and prosperity of this friendly nation. I would like to express my sincere thanks and appreciation to the India Foundation and the government of UAE for organizing this conference and for the warm and generous hospitality. As we grapple with the challenges of COVID-19, climate change, economic disruptions, 
I cannot overemphasize the theme, Indian Ocean Ecology Economy eco Epidemic, which is equally relevant for the coastal as well as landlocked countries. Gravity of these challenges demands our collective actions more urgently than ever. I am confident that the ideas we reflect in these two days will contribute towards this endeavor. Excellencies, we all have been talking about interconnectedness. The problems today transcending our borders have accentuated the rationale of the dictum that we live in one world. Take, for example, the question of ecology. Though miles away, the existence of oceans and mountains is inseparably linked. The ecosystems depend on each other. The Indian Ocean for long has been a source of nourishment and remained at the center of hydrological cycles. The weather patterns in this ocean has direct bearing on the mountains, stretching across the Hindukus Himalayas. The Himalayas instead feed the perennial rivers, serve as a heat sink in summer, and sustain the civilizational downstream. The looming climate crisis has not spared either of them. The sea level rises and ocean water gets more acidic on the one hand, and on the other, the high mountains are losing their snow covers. This is jeopardizing the lives and livelihoods of many. Marine as well as terrestrial biodiversity is fast deteriorating. Climate-induced disasters have engulfed coastal states and small islands, as well as the mountains. This intrinsic linkage should be well considered while pursuing the goal for healthy oceans as embodied by UN SDG 14. For any meaningful agenda on the ocean must therefore take on board the landlocked countries and mountainous ones as well. Excellencies, with its vast spread, the Indian Ocean is rich in resources. It provides important sea lanes that serve as arteries of international economy. Routes for more than three-fourths of the world's seaborne oil and one-third of the global trade, the Indian Ocean's significance is doubly attested in economic dimension as well as in its strategic value. Even for landlocked countries like Nepal, the Indian Ocean is a lifeline for majority of its external trade. Peace and stability in Indian Ocean are therefore important for all of us. Issues such as piracy, marine terrorism, drug trafficking, and interruption in freedom of navigation can erode economic vitality. Addressing these challenges should be an important pillar of the agenda to properly harness the potentials of the blue economy. An enlightened approach for economic cooperation in the region can enhance intra-regional trade and investments. Such a move will have multiplier effects and make this region a substantial powerhouse of the world economy. Landlocked developing countries are in need of international and regional support to enhance their capacity for reaping the benefits of the ocean, including in the utilization of the marine resources under the high seas. Realizing the already made commitments in an effective manner is crucial for enabling them in this regard. Distinguished delegates, epidemics trigger a heavy toll, not just on the economy, but also on our lives as a whole. In the interconnected world, epidemics are seldom local in nature and can quickly spiral into a global pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has come as an epochal phenomenon. It has revealed that we may be facing the same tempest, but the countries are in different wraps. 
Some are better equipped to fend off the crisis, while the poorer ones struggle to remain afloat. With lives lost and livelihoods disrupted, the pandemic has further entrenched poverty, strained public health systems, and exacerbated inequality. Fallouts have been felt in international trade and tourism, the lives of, lifelines of many countries in the region. Besides, we are entering the third year of the pandemic with new variants of concern circulating from nowhere. With therapeutics, innovation, and capacity to produce vaccine, the Indian Ocean region has the potentials to help save lives in the region and much beyond. Impressive advancement of India and the UAE as pharmaceutical and technological hubs has hugely contributed to this process. A more robust cooperation in vaccination will be a significant deliverable proving the real prospect of our collective endeavor. Also, sharing of technical know-how and capacity enhancement in the healthcare should be at the forefront of regional cooperation in the context of the pandemic. Distinguished delegates, Nepal attaches great importance to the Indian Ocean, its security, sustainability, and economic potentials. Linking our highlands with the Indian Ocean with seamless hardware and software of connectivity is our priority, and these include roads, railways, waterways, and power grid interconnection. Nepal is committed to increasing the share of clean energy and achieving net zero carbon emission by 2045, contributing to the region's ecology. Nepal has vast potentials in generating hydroelectricity to drive economic growth not only in the country, but also in our region. Nepal stands ready to work with all countries in the Indian Ocean region to address the challenges pertaining to ecology, economy, and epidemic. I conclude by com complimenting the organizing committee of the conference once again for this worthy initiative of creative dialogues on the most pertinent issue of our time. I feel hugely benefited from this rich deliberations over two days. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Secretary Podialji. I'll just open the house for questions. I'll just take one question for paucity of time. Thank you. If there are none, may I uh, invite General Dhruv Katoch to felicitate the <clears throat> uh, Secretary Podial. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I now invite uh, Madam Wasika Aisha Khan, Member of Parliament of Bangladesh, to make her observations. Distinguished moderator, distinguished panelists, delegates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. Shubha Apurano. I'm delighted to attend the fifth Indian Ocean Conference hosted by the Indian Foundation, India Foundation, in the UAE with the theme of ecology, economy, and epidemic. 
I am happy to be able to learn much in the last, uh, in today and yesterday. And uh, I would like to share some ideas of my, of Bangladesh's perspective and position in the combat against COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the climate emergency. And my um, deliberations will mostly focus on uh, our government's response to the pandemic, as well as its impact on our economy. Bangladesh uh, government steps were on the right direction and quite early as we took precautionary measures urgently and unhesitantly as alerted by the WHO. The first case was detected in Bangladesh in Dhaka as early as March 8, 2020. Despite some prior national programs, the government of uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina acted without delay and declared full lockdowns for several weeks with the shutdown of all economic activities across the country. The Honorable Prime Minister formulated the National Preparedness and Response Plan to address the pending threat and to control the and combat the virus. We, the, the government approach included a 31-point directive for all agencies to play their due part to combat this threat. These measures resulted in a positive outcome. You're aware that the situation has remained well under control for the last three months but now, with the emergence of the new variant, we must act promptly and together. As regards the vaccination program, Bangladesh was one of the early starters in terms of rolling out the inoculation as uh, early as 7th February in 2021. We have extensively utilized the information and telecommunication technology for implementation of the vaccination program through a software platform called Shurokha. As of 2nd December 2021, using this system, 62.73 million citizens, about 45.37% of the target population have received first doses of the vaccines, while 37.26 million, 27% of, of the target population have been duly vaccinated. So we have reached the 100 million number. We, the pandemic situation in Bangladesh is improving. But we are watching very carefully about the new variant issue. And we are also working on the mutual recognition of our vaccine certificates. This unprecedented global pandemic hit Bangladesh severely both at the economic and health front. While the level of infections and death rates in Bangladesh may be called modest, the losses in the economic front were uh, immense. However, due to the pragmatic measures of uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, the economic front has managed to turn around. Our economy, uh, which was projected to grow at over 8% in last fiscal year, achieved a modest 4% growth rate in 2020. And uh, 
5.4% so far in 2021. An important sector worst hit by COVID is our 12 million people working in the Middle Eastern countries and Southeast Asia. Through diplomatic efforts, the government has been trying to ensure both health and economic safety of these migrant workers during the pandemic. The government, in coordination with other stakeholders, has been devising policies for reskilling and reintegration of many repatriated workers into our economy, as well as resending them to either their previous or new destinations in the post-COVID era. The leadership of HPM Sheikh Hasina has been instrumental in ensuring adequate measures, the food security and economic stability in the country during the crisis. 28 stimulus packages, 4.9% of our G total GDP, which is the, comes to about more than US dollar 16 billion, are buying, being implemented for ensuring well-being of the people and business communities. The social safety net programs have been extended to a wider range so that poor and destitute dis people's distress can be minimized. We have also provided cash incentives to millions of helpless people to meet their immediate requirements during the pandemic. Our export industry was hard hit by the pandemic. It was initially faced with a major threat of loss of much money following the cancellation or suspension of orders by the buyers. You are aware that Bangladesh's ready-made garment sector is intertwined with the resumption of economic activities in Europe and the US. It is, a, it is a pleasure to note that with the opening of the normal activities in those countries, our RNG sector is gradually regaining its strength. Due to the pandemic, investment flow in Bangladesh was also negatively impacted, as was the case with the world around. There was a fall, according to a report by UNCTAD of 2020, there was a fall of 42% in the global FDI to an estimated uh, 859 billion in 2020 from US dollar 1.5 trillion in 2019. That is a huge number. And I'm sure impacts the nations across this region. Faced with such hurdles, Bangladesh government had to focus on increasing both local and foreign investments through reinvestments, merger and acquisitions, and greenfield investments into the country. The ongoing development activities like upgrading of the port, road and rail infrastructures and power plants, developing economic zones, etc., are going on in full swing. Bangladesh economy has overall proved to be rather resilient to the shocks brought about by COVID-19. despite the global economic downturn. Uh, in early October this year, World Bank forecast that Bangladesh's gross domestic product would grow by 6.4% in the 21-22 fiscal year, revising it up by 
1.3 percentage points from its previous forecast. The government, however, has set a 7.2 percent growth target for the current fiscal year. Bangladesh remains among the top resilient economies during the pandemic and is considered one of the prospective economies by the global business communities. Our economy was saved from a major blow because of our strong agricultural and rural base with capacity of adequate production of food and absorbing many un unemployed from the urban areas. The government is focusing on agriculture as one of its prioritized sectors under a 2020-2023 midterm plan to bring the COVID hit national economy back on track. The people engaged in the informal sectors were hit quite badly and a new group of poor has emerged. This will certainly challenge our goal to reduce extreme poverty to under 5% in the next five years. Bangladesh is a very climate vulnerable country. We are chairing the Climate Vulnerable Forum of the world, about 42 countries in total. And at the COP26, Bangladesh was very vocal about mobilizing finance and uh, the, to ensure the pledged $100 billion per year from the developed world to the developing world with an equal proportion for adaptation and mitigation. And Bangladesh was wanted to ensure the access of the vulnerable nations to the advanced technology for both adaptation and mitigation. And we addressed the loss and damage issue very clearly at the COP26. As the CVF chair, Bangladesh's uh, position at COP26 was lauded and we played a strong role under the dynamic leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. And the final outcome document has been named as the Glasgow, Glasgow Climate Pact, being influenced by the Climate Emergency Pact of the CVF. Before I conclude, I would like to state that the pandemic and the climate emergency are both global phenomena. Therefore, necessitates coordinate global, coordinated global response. I'm certain that uh, the IOC, Indian Ocean Conference, would be able to find some effective measures on the recovery from the economic downturn and facing the climate emergency of this region. Let the best practices positively impact our shared sustainable future in the Indian Ocean region. I would like to conclude with some words from Bangladesh's father of the nation, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Our total commitment to peace is born of the re realization that only an environment of peace would enable us to mobilize and concentrate all our energies and resources in combating the scourges of poverty, poverty, hunger, disease, illiteracy, and unemployment. I thank everyone for their attention. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabundhu, Bangladesh. May Bangladesh live long. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for your uh, deep insight into what Bangladesh is doing for 
the three subjects that, that we have chosen. Uh, I've, if you permit, we just got one question uh, from Sri Ram Madhavji. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, you see, Bangladesh is uh, the most densely populated country in the world, in the countries of more than 50 million population. The way you have managed the pandemic is fabulous. Actually, that is hats off to your leadership, Madam Sheikh Hasina's yeah, leadership. Uh, it's a story that we all would really love to hear, but maybe on some other occasion. But my simple question is, how did you manage with uh, the one million Rohingya refugees living in your country? Have they been fully vaccinated? Are you extending vaccination facilities to them also? What is your government's program? Thank you, Ram Madhavji. Thank you. This is a very pertinent question. Yes, we Bangladesh uh, allowed the forcibly displaced Rohingya population entry, and they have been there for a few years now. The camps are also densely populated, and uh, they are under the vaccination program. We are the government, the way the government is providing free vaccination to the Bangladeshi citizens, the displaced Rohingya population are also being vaccinated. And it was very challenging when the pandemic began because the camps are in a separate area and they are, like I said, densely populated and uh, you know infection in the camps would have been disastrous there were medical facilities urgently made in the area and uh, with ICUs and uh, medicine was made available and they are under the vaccination program it is uh, Bangladesh began vaccination quite early and had had there not been disruption in supply, we would have been fully vaccinated by now, I think. So we are aiming to be fully vaccinated by February 2022. Thank you if that answers your question. Thank you, Madam. Just one more minute. Uh, may I now request uh, Mrs. Sonu Trivediji, Director ICCR Seoul, to felicitate the Honourable Member of Parliament. We are not having any coffee break now, we are continuing into plenary four, so please don't go away. Thank you.